welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is another fantastic instalment from the wonderful mind of Wayne Harbison. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. Been down in a bit of a rut lately, guys, for the past week, trying to get myself out of it. Um, apologies for that. But life is a roller coaster of ups and downs. And it's time to get back on the up. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled Shadows Over Mobile Bay. Part 3 A Thief in the Night. Let's get straight into that. Again, Captain McNaughton, I find you linked to a scene of death and violence. What do you have to say for yourself? Colonel Shepard asked as he oversaw the removal of what was left of the adventuring band of Union soldiers. It was a grisly sight of half-eaten men, blood and internal organs spread so wide that it was nigh impossible to place to whom each of the organs might belong to. There was the smell of bowel as the lower intestines of at least two men had been ripped open. The blood seemed to hang in the air like a cloud of mosquitoes awaiting an opportunity to light upon the most vulnerable surface available. The men engaged in the clean-up were more than just a bit ashen in the face. As for myself, I was more disturbed by the presence of the freed men soldiers that a colonel had brought with them. I kept them under close watch. The outrage of them being on my property was not something I took lightly. Quietly, uh, with my voice tightly controlled as not to give away what I was feeling, what the beast in my soul was demanding, I said, I was here last night when I heard the gunshots and the screaming. I decided that it would be best if I stayed in my tent as I was unarmed. I shrugged as I watched them load Tompkins' broken and torn body onto the wagon pulled by two large draft horses. I could barely control the grim smile that threatened my face at the sight. You seem to make it a habit of travelling unarmed, Shepard said. That could get you killed some day. Perhaps, but I do not wish to be accused of raising arms again against our conquerors. Unlike the government, I keep my oaths. I have already lost both, my parents and my sisters. I would not lose my honour. I focused my will into my tail, and in my mind's eye I could see it permeating the colonel's body like a fog. Do you have any idea why these men felt it necessary to invade my property last evening? Was it under some kind of orders? He shook his head and said nothing about the shadow I had cast on the government's honour. No. They had no passes and were gone from the post without the approval of their commanding officers. That one, I nodded towards Tompkins, was a lieutenant, was he not? He was. Perhaps he ordered it, I asked. It would have to have been cleared by someone in his chain of command. If I may be so bold, Colonel Shepard, it was a mistake to muster out your volunteer soldiers so early. All you have left to carry out your occupation are a few regulars of questionable ability and honour, and several African regiments which cause more trouble among their own kind than they keep in order. Needless to say, the fact that you have chosen to keep them in place under the pretense of protecting the peace continues to be a kick in the soul of a good people of Alabama. It does not lend itself to any reconciliation between the races. But alas, the treatment received by the Southern folk was in violation of the terms of surrender as expressed in our paroles. The Southern soldiers could have carried out a guerrilla warfare for years. The United States made terms with men who had arms in their hands. They had lamed them down. And the United States had violated these terms and punished individuals for alleged crimes without trial. Yet, our parole stated that we were not to be disturbed as long as we are law-abiding. This whole reconstruction is a violation of the terms of our surrender as we, the Southern soldiers, understood it. It is a punishment of whole people by the legislative enactment. And contrary to the spirit of the American institutions, it was not a matter of law, but a common honesty. I am aware of the limitations of my troops, Captain McNaughton. Shepard barked. As for your paroles and the changes made to them by the US government to see to the peace, 
You can blame that thrice damned actor for your current situation. Pray that we do not have to need to change them further. Then, taking a deep breath and composing himself, he continued. You still haven't explained to me why none of your workmen were at the site and why you were here alone. I gave the workmen three days off. They've been working tirelessly for me for the last few months and deserve some refreshment. Again, I pushed my will into what I was saying and watched it settle over the colonel like a warm blanket. As for why I'm alone, I was studying the plans for Bon Travail and making adjustments to them based on new information that had come to light. Your wall can't be built on this particular soil, Shepard said firmly. Exactly, I told him coldly. I take it then that you have a spy among my household. He laughed and shook his head. No, but I've studied the great castles of old Europe and the forts built here in the America during the Revolutionary War and later that of 1812. His voice became serious again. You are not the only graduate of West Point here, sir. I nodded to him. You may consider my property rebuked. Damn it, man! I want to know why the cat didn't attack you. He changed the subject on me. I indicated the killing fields and said, Perhaps he had eaten its fill. I would consider that a viable answer, but for one thing. And what would that be? Follow me and let me show you. He said as he began to walk back down the road. He pointed to the tracks and places in the tall grass that were bent, broken and bloodied by the men whose bodies I had lain down the night before. Three men picked off from behind so as not to alert their comrades. These men were eliminated brutally and stealthily. That left nine more and one upon horseback in the lead. He led me back to the scene of the final battle, pointing out the cat's tracks. This cat seems to walk on two legs and followed the men. Now here is where nine men were attacked en masse. Eight died. Picking our way through the bloodied remains, we came to the head of the column and he noted a new set of tracks. This cat, although it appeared to be on two legs as the one in the back, was somewhat smaller, but no less ferocious. Now, I have not one swamp painter to deal with, but two. The papers are going to have a riot with this. As for myself, there was no pal of remorse upon my soul for what I had done the night before. I, as well as the beast inside me, was well pleased with the outcome. At least one of the men who was responsible for the violation and murder of my family had been amongst the dead. It was a good start as far as I was concerned. An African soldier carrying a rifle came running up to the two of us, and then without saluting blurted out, Colonel Shepard, sir, this and three other rifles have been fired. I glared at the man. I knew that Shepard had little choice, and for the time being neither did I, but that man's presence on my property caused a knot in my soul that irritated the beast. Instead of protesting, I smiled and indicated the man's lack of discipline and military decorum with my head. As I suggested, perhaps the early mustering of volunteers was a mistake. Be that as it may, Shepard told me before turning to the man. Who is your commander, Private? It were Lieutenant Turner, Colonel Sir. But he got sent up north. Of course, he was mistreated with white women and he got assigned to Lieutenant Tompkins, Sir. Shepard must have seen something in the dark look I shot the African soldier. You men get these bodies collected get back to Bay Minet before the city of Dauphine steals back the county court's house's records. Yes, sir. The soldier gave me a dark look and turned back to follow the colonel's orders to the best of his ability. Back to my questions, Captain McNaughton. Shepard turned back to me. Why I wasn't attacked? I asked. Yes, he replied. I have no idea. Once I heard the gunfire and the screaming begin, I doused my light and covered my fire until the morning gleaming. It's not like this thing hasn't attacked me in the past. There is that in your favour, Captain. Still, you seem to be connected in some way to the scenes of all three attacks. I take it you have these plans with you, he demanded. I do, back of my tent. I indicated the direction of my camp with my head. What are your plans for tonight? I am yet undecided. I'm tempted to return home for a rifle and then come back here and wait to see if this ghost can of yours shows up again. I would advise against it, he said. 
I may have to send out patrols tonight, and it would be best if you not be out in the dark. I gave him a long stare. This property belongs to my brother, Colonel Shepard. If I should choose to spend another night in this camp, it will be best that you warn off your patrols that they are unwelcome on this particular plot of land. My soldiers will go where they are needed. His voice was firm, and there was a hint of iron in its will. In my mind's eye, I could see the satisfaction that clapping me into irons would give him. I am in charge here, Captain McNaughton, not you. As you say, I told him, you are in charge. I will shed not a tear for the loss of any more of your less competent officers, nor for any freedmen soldiers who might shed their heart's blood upon this soil. Shepard took a deep breath as if to calm himself. Just stay at your home in Biomenu this evening. You are proving to be as difficult for me to manage as the Freedmen's Bureau. I do not take kindly to comparisons to that particular organisation, especially since they spent the last several months sowing the thought into the Freedmen's head that there is going to be a confiscation of the southern lands and it be redistributed to them and the Loyalists. I nearly spat the last word. And I don't take kindly to insubordination. I am not one of your soldiers, Colonel. I am a civilian, a former soldier who is living exactly by the standards laid down in his parole. Even if you and your government are not, the freedmen come onto this property at their own peril. Is that a threat? Does it need to be? I asked. You lost twelve men last night to a common swamp cat. A swamp cat that walks on two legs is hardly common, Captain. I've seen no proof that it does so. Even the best Indian tracker could not tell definitively if a bear is on two feet or four. I would say the same is even more true for large cats. What you have is a swamp painter or maybe a pair who are hunting in tandem. Perhaps there are kits on the way and they are preparing for that. In the autumn? I hardly think so. The colonel dismissed my suggestion. Nevertheless, Colonel Shepard, I think that you are letting the superstitions of your troops interfere with your own good sense. Perhaps I should put a bounty on it. I, I laughed and told him. You will need to make it an impressive one. So far the cat has only slain freedmen, Union League operatives and Yankees. You put a bounty on it and the men of Mobile Bay will be toasting to it in the taverns by sundown. Hmm, we will see, Captain. We will see, he told me. In the meantime, I think it's best for you to return to your home in Biomenu and leave the hunting of cats to the US Army. I smiled coldly and told him, huh, As you wish, Colonel. As you wish. It was at this point that the soldiers, and I use that word loosely, looked up from their grisly duty to watch a carriage make its way around the bend on the old road to town. Much to my surprise, I recognised my own coach. Turning to the Colonel, I asked, You're doing? No, Captain McNaughton. But if I thought of it, it would have been. We waited in silence as the black coach made its way down the road. It stopped behind the soldiers, and the coachman climbed down from his seat and picked his way past the late autumn goldenrod that had cropped up between the ruts and the road. After a few moments, he reached for the colonel, and I was standing. What is it, Johnson? I asked. A note from Donovan, sir. He handed me a crisp, folded letter which had been sealed with wax. Slipping the nail of my forefinger under the wax, I sliced it open and folded the paper. It read simply, Telegraph from Clearwater. Mrs. McNaughton is due on the evening tide. Donovan. Looking up from the paper, I told Colonel Shepard, It would seem that you get your wish, sir. My grandmother is arriving from Charleston on the evening tide, so I will not be returning here until the work is due on Tuesday. Your grandmother? He asked. Yes, I told him. She is a Dubois of that city who married into the McNaughton family. I asked her to come over and oversee certain plans. I believe she and Mrs. Beaumare are likely to understand each other more than I would. All I must do is show up and answer a few questions in the affirmative. It would seem that Miss Silveria and the rest of the party have far more involved roles to play. Perhaps a change in your social status will keep you from any more mischief, Captain. Hmm, I am told that it should, but we will see, Colonel. I have been married once already, and it did not change my habits that much. I tipped my hats and said, Good day, sir. 
The trip to Dauphine and the 11 miles aboard the ferry took up the remainder of the day. We barely made it before the tide and Stephen Dubois docked at the quay. Leave it to my grandmother to only travel aboard a ship owned by her brother, Edward. After gathering a tall silver-haired woman who despite being far older than she appeared looked quite spry and elegant as she disembarked from the ship, we greeted each other cordially as two stevedores loaded her bags aboard the coach. You are looking well, grandmother, I said looking her up and down. I considered making a glib reply about how she looked so young, but realised it would be an affection of airs I had no desire, nor need to take. You, however, look worried, young Sheridan. Much has happened since I sent you the telegraph. She stopped and studied me closely, holding me at arm's length. Then, with a serious nod, she said, So it has happened. I warned your father that you should be sent to me when you first started growing and showing your other witcheries. Now, he is gone, and the damage is done. We will see how much we can mitigate it. As you wish, grandmother. I said solemnly. My toe must have caught her attention as she turned back to me and asked, What has happened? Uh, a great deal. A nocturnal adventure. The change, as you called it, and a connection. I cannot explain. Again, she peered at me for long moments, and even as a man fully grown and commissioned as an officer, I still felt uncomfortable under her gaze. She seemed to peer directly into my soul. Finally, she asked, and what form or forms? I waited until we were in the coach and it was closed before answering. A large white cat, I believe, and possibly a falcon or hawk and an owl. Not in her head, she said. And your other witcheries? I'm still learning. All of them have strengthened since that first full moon, I told her. Ah, that's something we're going to have to nip in the bud. The change in our family has never been linked to phases of the moon. I don't understand, I told her. Oh, of course you don't, Sheridan. Your father never taught you. He was only interested in your witcheries from his father's line. For a moment, I considered defending my father, but two things held my tongue. The first was that, as my grandmother and his mother, she had all the right in the world to judge his actions. The other was, of course, that she was right. Seeming to catch the stray thought, she smiled and said, you may be brighter than I give you credit for. Yes, ma'am, I told her as the coach started the journey south to Bayou Menu. It was only about three miles as the crow flies, but by carriage, it was going to be a few hours. I knew that I should be fatigued, but found myself alert and awake despite having only slept a few hours towards dawn. And how is young Theodore faring? she asked. He is recuperating at a rapid pace, I answered. It's quite remarkable. She smiled and said, mm, No doubt. I am unaware of any witcheries he may have inherited from his mother, but those from your father should just be now awakening in him as well. You mean these? I asked as I held up my hand and relaxed the tight control I'd been practicing since I awoke that first full moon. I watched as the blue webbing appeared between my fingers. Nodding, she said, mm, Definitely those. They come from the McNaughton line. There's a strong strain of Nixie running through that side of the family. That is where you gained the witcheries that have helped you rebuild your fortune. But now that you have begun to tap into the European funds, it is necessary that we discuss how you plan to use those finances as they affect the rest of your family. As you wish, I told her again. You seem rather malleable at this time, Sheridan. It's not what I expected of a man who served as captain under General Lee. I am simply collecting information for now. When I have enough information to make a particular decision that truly matters, I hope to be well informed enough to make a wise one. She smiled hugely and said, So, your will has not been broken. Good. My will? Broken? I asked. You were there when General Lee surrendered, and you've been home for a while now and seen the damage that a hell spawn of New England Puritans has unleashed on our conquered Dixie. There is some concern that among my brothers that you may have given up. I snorted the derision I had gave that particular idea. Hardly, madam. I have my own plans. And those plans include putting Theodore as far as I am able to. 
away from the mischief caused by the Union Army and its troops, or those who have been sent to Montgomery, or even Washington, who wish to pitifully ape the actions of statesmen. You cannot protect him forever, Sheridan, and he may come to resent the walls you build around him. He has his own witcheries. They will need to be cultivated and honed, as much as yours. I nodded. It was a thought that occurred to me several times over the last few months as I watched him heal and grow stronger, watched the budding of a personality far wiser than his ten years should be. Perhaps that is something which you could assist us with, I asked. It is among my plans for coming to Mobile. I am not pleased with the state your father has left what his father had built for you. There was a warning tone to her voice that did not bode well for my father's memory and possibly myself as well. Then, folding her hands neatly in her lap, she said, Now tell me about this fiancé of yours. I smiled and changed the subject. Her name is Elviria Beaumere, and her family line goes back to the French nobility of Brittany. Her family was rescued by a certain English nobleman known for his daring do during the horror that was the French Revolution. She has intimated to me that the line reaches back to Tristan, and this sled of the white hands. I am aware of the line, she said neutrally. That is her family. I want to know about her. Then she made it clear that she did know more than I did. She added, What you know and what you suspect. And so I told her about hiring her to take care of Teddy when I had returned from Appomattox and of her diligent care of not only Theodore but of her yeoman's service to her household. I told her of the dreams I'd had of another great cat, of seeing her and her mother gathering herbs and roots by the moonlight, and of the other cat I met last night. She listened to both my tale and my suppositions attentively. When I was done, I told her, and that's about it. She smiled and said, I know that you did not describe her form. This speaks well of your state of mind entering into this marriage. Shrugging, I said, oh, She's young, and just now old enough to enter society, if such a society still existed. Her hair is golden, and her eyes the same blue as that of the sky, and she's quite attractive. No doubt, my grandmother replied matter of factly. And it was two hours later, in the dinner hour, when we arrived at the home I was renting until Bontravel could be built. Teddy was excited to see our grandmother, as he, like myself, had not seen her since, before his recent unpleasantness with the North. After placing her bags in the room prepared for her, she came back downstairs where Teddy and I were waiting. After a moment of hesitation, he flew to her, his eyes brimming with tears, and for just a moment, I saw the prematurely matured boy fade away to the boy he should be. And for long moments, she petted him as she rocked back and forth, his head nearly buried in her bosom of her dress. Now. It's good to see you again, Theodore, but this would be an awkward way to eat dinner. Nodding, he sniffled and wiped away his tears and his nose with a handkerchief he'd carried and said, I'm sorry, Grandma Kate. It's just so good to see you again. You should barely be able to remember me, she said, astounded. He leaned up to her ear and whispered something I could not hear. Grandmother's expression became one of astonishment and then she smiled and hugged him again. I'm surprised you remember that, she said. You told me not to forget, he replied, and you didn't. Her face became one of pleasant surprise and endearment as Teddy guided her to the place of honour at the table. You have been learning your lessons in manners quite well, she said as he pulled out a chair for her. Dan, make sure I don't forget, she smiled over at me and said. Mm, in that case... Please let us all sit and enjoy the food that blesses our table this evening. I joined them at the table. In the traditional place of the patriarch, she smiled and nodded to me in the affirmation. And we began our meal sans the traditional grace. As I said before, God did little good for my mother and sisters and brother when they needed him most. So my attitude was to render him little more than what the polite society demanded. Our dinner conversation was light and of inconsequential matters. Grandmother complimented our cook for a well-prepared dinner of fish and crab. You seem to be fairer and better than the rest of Mobile, she finally said. Certain gifts from you and Grandfather makes that possible, I told her. 
Of those we will speak after dinner. Then she turned to Teddy and said, And I believe that Theodore may find what I have to say to be of interest. I was surprised by this, but realized that I shouldn't be. Grandmother was here for several reasons, and one of those was to help me and Teddy deal with our witcheries. It was time that he had those identified, and he received instruction on how to, and the wisdom to know when to use them. It was an hour later when the dishes had been cleared that the three of us retired to the drawing room for apparatives. Again, it was nearly as much chicory as it was coffee, but it was still refreshing. Of course, the amount of rum in Theodore's coffee and chicory was about half of that of mine and Grandmother Kate's. Now, Grandmother began, we have much to discuss, first the three of us, and then possibly this Miss Beaumare as well. She turned to Teddy and cut to the heart of matter. And how do you feel about your brother taking your nurse as a wife? He smiled over at me and said, I'm quite happy for both of them. Grandmother nodded and then asked, And how do you feel about what has happened to you at the hands of our conquerors and those on whose behalf they invaded our lands? I want nothing to do with them, Grandmother. There was a deep and abiding hate in my heart for both the freedmen as well as those who claimed to have removed them from their shackles. Grandmother gave him a surprised look. Claimed to have removed their shackles? What do you mean? I've seen them fawn over the federal officers, the Freedmen's Bureau agents, the missionaries, carpetbaggers and adventurers coming to the South to make their fortunes. They have simply exchanged one master for another. Well, that's rather immature of you. Grandmother said. I've done a lot of growing up since that horrible night in April, he said. I have done so out of necessity, if nothing else. And so you have, Grandmother said approvingly. And how do you feel about the other changes you've experienced? Teddy blushed and said. It happens to all men. She laughed, telling him, Not those particular changes, young man. I mean those you've discovered while swimming. Those that cannot be explained by mere mortal science. Teddy shrugged. They both excite and frighten me, he told her. As they should, she said. And you are aware that your brother has several witcheries that you may or may not share? I had my suspicions. Good, she said. Now, how about Miss Elviria? Do you believe she might be in possession of such gifts? I'm positive. Why have you said nothing to me? I asked. Because they are your business and, and hers, Teddy replied. You've always told me not to spread rumours, and I might be young, but I know that kind of rumour can get a body burned at a stake, especially with these thrice-damned New Englanders running around. It's only been a century or so since they hanged their last witch. I shook my head once. Again, your wisdom astounds me, Tadpole. Tadpole? Grandma asked. A pet name, I told her. He could swim before he could walk. She grinned and said, Ha! Huh, your father was the same. You are aware of the existence of witcheries and witchkin, then? Grandmother asked. Not that it was what they are called, but I am aware that both Dan and Miss Ilveria have them, and to some extent so do I. At first I thought they might be something inherited from his mother, Erwin. Some of them are... Grandmother told him. But some of them are from your father's side as well. She leaned back and said, Officially, I am here to help with the planning of your wedding and to help your young family get settled into your new estate. If anyone from the outside of the family should ask, that is what you are to tell them. She stopped and looked at Teddy and said, And you are a wise beyond your years for not trusting New Englanders. We had more trouble out of John Adams when we were forging this country than we did from just about any other founding fathers. To coin a phrase, he was obnoxious and greatly disliked. He was quick to turn to the use of power of federal government to solve what should have been regional issues between states. Taking the opportunity to be direct, I said, I have two questions, Grandmother. And they are? The first is... Do you have any idea what kind of witchkin my mother was? She shook her head and said, No. Your mother and her mother were an enigma to the rest of the family. If we'd only known that snake Merlin Helmwood was here, 
We might have averted that particular disaster. Her tone tasted of hate and iron. What is your other question? I nodded and said, Have you ever heard of a man named Lord Westhall? Her head twisted around to face me. Fire was in her eyes, and the iron in her voice was forged into sharp, gleaming steel. Where did you hear that name? He was the leader of the men who landed near the ruins of Chateau de la Mer last night. He managed to escape by turning himself into a ball of shadow and then into a bat. Not only that, but he indicated to Lieutenant Tompkins that it was under his orders that the bombers came back to Chateau de la Mer in 1864. It was on his orders that our family was nearly destroyed. Count your fates as lucky that you did not catch him, as he has been a thorn in the side of our family, both sides, since the Revolutionary War. It was his actions that brought the rest of our family firmly on the side of independence. Why? What did he do? Teddy asked. He murdered my father. He hanged him, decapitated him drove a wooden stake through his heart and then burned the parts of the body separately and scattered the ashes to the four winds. Why on earth would he do something like that? I asked. To keep him from coming back to life. It is an uncontrollable witchery that all of his children had. It seems to be lost by our father's generation. Revivification? I asked in nearly in disbelief. How? We don't know. It's something that is lost on our family line. James made a study of it, but came to a little actual conclusions about it. All we know is that we stop aging at some point, usually in our late twenties. Those of us who suffer wounds sufficient to kill us are revivified an indeterminate number of days afterwards. If that is before our late twenties, that is our final, natural appearance. Poor Kiernan was killed at sixteen by a creature raised by Westhall called the Gwyna, and now forever looks like a boy. Her words left me stunned. I never heard such a thing, but it might explain some of the things I'd noticed about myself. Could that be why I lack a beard? She looked over at Teddy and studied him for a long moment, seeming to peer deep into his being, as if she could see the very elements that made up his flesh and blood. Finally, she shook her head and said, No, I would say that it is something you inherited from your mother. Perhaps it is a trait of her bloodline. It is something we can explore together. I smiled wanly and nodded. What about Westhall? If he is a threat, I looked over at Teddy and then back to her. He needs to be neutralized. Grandmother smiled broadly and said, If he's working against you, or as you said against the family, then we are truly in danger, and it may take your will as well as mine, Theodore's and Miss Beaumaire's, to neutralize him, as you say. Is he really that dangerous? I asked. He escaped and invaded you last night. That should tell you something. Kinan made a nearly century-long study of the man. He was the power behind the English throne from the 16th century until the turn of this one, and he still has influence across the world. So the world is balanced between the Lord Westhall and the Dubois? I asked. Not quite, she replied with a smile. We only influence political affairs in order to secure the safety and fortunes of our family. Westhall's motivations are an enigma to us even now. She must have seen the confusion on my face for she asked. What? Do you think your family is all light and good spirits? She shook her head and answered her own question. We're not. Boone became the South Carolinian delegation to Philadelphia by murdering the previous ones and then casting blame onto a slave. Edward is as much a pirate as he was a sea captain. He supplied many of the slaves that James sold from the auction block by running down English ships and taking them by force. Loop is not above eating those who cross him. Kinan has been the downfall of many a woman and gets much of the knowledge he uses to blackmail our enemies between the sheets. She paused and then looked over at Theodore for a moment before continuing. And I have operated brothels across the eastern seaboard and Gulf Coast for over a century. We are not angels, Sheridan. Far from it. But we are powerful. And what we do, we do for family, then country. We probably would have been neutral throughout the war were it not for Westhall killing father. 
We took advantage of the situation to not only increase our fortunes, but to bring about a stable government in which we could thrive. I nodded, having long suspected that our family's origins were much darker than I'd been told. A family this steeped in the witchkin blood would be a necessity to have a shadow side. Then how do we neutralize, if not kill him? We could try doing to him what he did to your father, Theodore suggested. Grandmother shook her head and said, We tried something like that during the war. Kiernan even chained him to the front of the 50-pound cannon and fired it. He still managed to put himself back together within a few moments. Kiernan must have a particular hatred of him then, I suggested. Oh, he does. Westall raised Iguana from the broken bodies of James's failures to breed lycanthropy into slaves he addicted to the certain exotic plants and then set the beast loose on him. That resulted in Kiernan dying at 16. He is still quite angry about that. That made me stop and think. Just how many of your brothers are still alive? All of them, Grandmother said. We've expanded, diversified, but all six of us are still alive. And Grandfather? I would suspect he would still be alive had he not met his own end at Westhall's hands. I could hear the deep sadness in her voice. Unfortunately, he did not have a particular gift for revivification. I nodded. My own father spoke almost as little of his father as he did my mother. So what should we do? Continue as you have. Westhall will make his move soon enough. Simply be prepared to counter whatever he does. As for Theodora and myself, we will be working with Mrs. Beaumere on the plans for your nuptials. Done, Theodore said. Be careful. You're the only sibling I have left. I'd hate to lose you too. I will, I told him. I do not intend to pick a fight, but I have a plan for this family's fortune and status, and I am not going to let some half-dead Englishman with delusions of godhood stop them. I will see both the McNaughton fortune as well as that of my beloved Alabama climb out of this perpetual punishment of poverty, with which those in the North seem to be determined to shackle us. What of this change? Theodore asked. Tonight is yet another full moon, followed again by tomorrow. I looked over to Grandmother and asked. You say the shift is not tied to the moon? No, she told me. Perhaps your mother's gift was, but those of our line are not. I reached deep inside myself. I could feel the beast alert and ready. But it did not have the same caged quality I had sensed that first night with Merlin Holmwood. Perhaps it was grandmother's presence, or an understanding. I may not control it, but neither it does not control me. I feel it, but it is not demanding to be set free as it has other times. In that case, I suggest we retire for the evening, Grandmother said. I suspect things will start to firm up starting tomorrow. I smiled and said, You two go on up. I know you must be tired, Grandmother, from your long voyage around Florida. I think I will stay up and do some more reading this evening. What tomb has captured my grandson's imagination? She asked. No tomb. I'm afraid, I told her. It is instead the body of a new law passed by that cappering barrel of half-wits in Montgomery. To what purpose? To find whatever loopholes might be advantageous to my plans, I told her. She simply smiled at me and said, That is the Dubois spirit. Then she headed up with a good night, Sheridan. Good night, Grandmother. I looked at Teddy and said, Good night, Tadpole. Good night, Dan. He replied and followed grandmother up the stairs as I settled into my reading desk and began to study the mishmash of chaos the legislator had passed. I could find much that was written by one financial or industrial interest or another and passed on to the half-literate representatives that populated Montgomery these days. There was also much there that was written, and usually poorly, that was entirely to the benefit of those self-same legislators. A prime example being a lower pass to relieve the legislative body of the pains of bigamy. It was half past midnight when I rose and made my way upstairs to seek my own bed. I was at the first landing when I heard a scuffling of feet on the front porch. 
Something flared to life in my gut. It set my nerves to thrumming, not unlike the change I had experienced the night before. Something not of the natural world was on my doorstep. I stopped and waited, straining to hear if they would knock or try the door. A few heartbeats passed until I heard a wood rasp voice call out softly. Captain McNaughton? Something in that voice chilled me to the bone. I had heard it before. My mind knew that, but the rasp in the voice disguised it. It started to call out, but then the thought better of waking the house. Instead, I waited to see if it would speak again. I was not disappointed, as again I heard. Captain McNaughton. Padding down the stairs on quiet feet, I went to the window next to the door and pulled back the curtain. Just inside the fence, a huge creature stood. It was like some giant wolf on two legs and standing nearly nine feet tall, with fur so black as to throw back no reflection from the gaslight at the gate. Deep amber eyes glowed with an eerie malevolence from the dog-shaped head. Captain McNaughton. It called again. Opening the door, I stepped out onto the front porch and stared directly into the dead eyes of evil. I am Captain McNaughton, I said in a firm and clear voice. A feat that I could count as one of my most hard-earned. What is it that you wish, Hellspawn? <laughs> the thing chuckled at me low and gravelly. Hardly how spawned. I am shivered and spawn. I am forged from the flesh and bone you yourself have slain. The bodies of the men you ambushed last night have not gone to waste. I will devour your heart and then your soul, father. This last was said in a mocking voice as if to twist a knife into my gut. Suddenly it lashed out with a dark claw from across the yard. I felt a searing pain across my face as the thing laughed. Holding a hand to my cheek, I drew back blood while the thing was still yards away from me. Lowering my head, I threw my will into my voice and growled, BE GONE, HELL SPAWN! My will hit it like a battering ram. It was knocked back through the gate, pulling it from its moorings and crushing the pickets. The racket the beast had raised sent several residents of the street scrambling from their beds to see what was the matter. I simply stood there, holding my face where it had clawed me without even physically touching me. I could feel blood running not only from the wound, but from my eyes as well. As the front door of the house next to Az opened, the creature took a long look at me and I could hear it say in my mind, I'll be back to feast on the hearts of you and your family. It then turned tail and loped into the shadows on all fours. What was that, Captain McNaughton? My neighbour asked. A large and unpleasant stray dog, Mr Widmore. Nothing more. Thank God! The man said. I was afraid that it might be the Swamp Cat that attacked the Union Leaguer down by the river. I smiled and said, Hardly. Good evening, Mr. Whitmore. I turned back to go inside. Sleep well. Good evening, Captain McNaughton. He replied and closed his own front door. Closing mine, I saw Grandmother standing at the middle landing. And? I believe it was the creature we discussed earlier this evening. It told me it was forged from the bodies of the men I killed last night. I told her calmly. And still the beast sleeps? She asked. It approves. I told her as the image of the cat purring filled my mind. And what next? I asked. Next I get a pan and a washcloth and we clean up the mess on your face. Grandmother said coming down the stairs. I nodded, realizing that she was going to do what she wanted to do, no matter what I had to say. A long time ago, I learned the importance of choosing my battles wisely. I simply said, thank you, grandmother. I was up early the next morning to inspect the damage done to the gate and the fence. It would, of course, have been repaired, so I asked Donovan to take care of it. That was, after all, what an estate captain does. That freed me up to do some investigation. I took my leave from my grandmother and brother, as they prepared to receive Mrs. Beaumare to discuss our wedding. My first step was to identify where I could find this Lord Westhall, a feat made that much more difficult by the fact that I did not even know his given name. Uh, because of this, I meant to employ the more acute senses that my witcheries gave me and try to track that feeling I gained from the creature 
unleashed on my family. If that meant riding up and down the streets of Mobile until I found him, then so be it. And if all else failed, I could always travel out to the ruins of Chateau de la Mer this evening, to the old mausoleum, and see if he would try to return there to find the McNaughton treasure. I had my reservations on this last, as I believed that searching for said treasure had been a ruse for some other perfidy Westhall had planned. Still, he felt the need for soldiers to escort him, or perhaps to do the manual labour for him, and so it might be worth the trip. The morning temperatures were in the middle fifties, and the skies were clear, and so it was a pleasant day for such a grim ride. I did notice that there seemed to be a far fewer pickets at the end of the streets, and briefly wondered what would convince Shepard to remove them. I was not unhappy about the issue, but wondered if my words to him earlier had begun to sink in. It did, however, make my moving about the city that much easier. By the time the dinner hour rolled around, I had covered most of the main part of the city, from Stone Street Road to Canal Street, and from the Quay to Anne Avenue. What I had discovered was quite revealing. Mobile seemed to be the gathering point for the Witchkin. During the day, I felt a sense surge through my veins a score of times, but never what I felt last night, or the night I first encountered Westhall. As I entered our home in Beaumont Menu, I was both exhausted and amazed at what I found. Grandmother met me at the door. Mrs. Beaumont and Miss Elveria will be joining us for dinner this evening. I smiled and told her, thank you. Any luck? I chuckled sarcastically and told her, I had no idea there were that many people with witcheries in Mobile. She smiled and said, well, Most of them are so minor that the people who possess them don't even realise that it is witcheries working for them. But for some reason, those of us witchkin blood tend to be drawn to each other and to the same places. I suppose that it is as it should be. It makes using this new sense to search for Westall that much more difficult. Nothing worthwhile is easy. Grandmother told me. As you say, I answered. But for now, I have guests, and it is my duty to be a good host. And your first duty to your guests is not to smell like a horse. Remember, you are not the only person in this extended family with an exceptional nose. I will return shortly, I told her, as I headed upstairs. Much to my surprise, I found that Donovan had lain out my evening suit and filled the wash basin. Dr. Meacham had described my mode of dress as fastidious of the cat, and I cannot deny the description. The time also gave me the opportunity to put the cares of the day away and focus on my guests. We settled into dinner of ham steaks, corn, greens, and for dessert, a crisp pear tart. And to be honest, I was somewhat ashamed of the meagre fare my table presented, but it was a sign of the times. Food was in short supplied, and, as Westhall had told Tompkins, I was one of the few people importing it. And how was your search? Mrs. Beaumere asked. I gave Grandmother a questioning look. Oh, don't be surprised, Captain McNaughton. I... She looked over at Elveria. We are aware that there was a disturbance here last night, and that you were out looking for it all during the day. You and Elveria are very nearly family, Mrs. Beaumere. We are happy to have you, Theodore said softly. Why, thank you, Theodore, Averia said next to him. Mrs. McNaughton tells me that you spent some time last evening pursuing the recent spate of laws that has come out of Montgomery. Anything of real interest there? I shook my head. Nothing passed for the good of Alabama. Most of it was designed to give one northern interest or industry an advantage over another, or was passed to service the legislators personally. I fear that it is going to be some time before we can hope to get good men of goodwill and ability to Montgomery. Several of the new legislators have never been residents of Alabama until after the war, and some have never even been to their district. Others are barely literate, and some not so at all. Any word from Colonel Shepard about the soldiers killed on the ruins of Chateau de la Mer? Theodore asked. The Colonel was not seen fit to inform me of the results of his investigation, or if there even was one. The fact that the soldiers were absent without leave is a dark mark on the garrison itself. 
perhaps he is trying to keep down any political embarrassments. He did mention that he was considering putting a bounty on the cat or cats that were doing this. I told him that if he did, the good people of Mobile would be toasting in its taverns by sundown. <laughs> you are probably right, Elviria said picking up a wine goblet. I believe with your permission, Captain, that I will make such a toast. Please, I told her. Raising her glass, she said, To the cats or cat responsible for whittling down the damn Yankees and their forces. There was such a vehemence in her azure eyes and in her voice that I believe that God in his heaven took notice and shuddered. We all returned her salute, and for long moments the dinner table was silent except for the normal gastronomical sounds associated with it. Grandmother and Mrs. Beaumere kept smiling to each other or themselves, a sight that filled my soul with trepidation. It was well into the tart that the tension of the table lessened to the point that genteel conversation returned. As I had suggested, after dinner, we retired to the parlour to discuss things that were not for the ears of the servants. Again, the apparatives were shared as we settled in to discuss the events of the ladies' day. Am I to assume from that smile that you and grandmother are sharing that you ladies reach an arrangement you will find agreeable? You are, grandmother said. After long discussions of family history, of status, and of familial goals, I will tell you, Sheridan, that I find this more than a suitable match for both sides. Mrs. Beaumere nodded and added, Mrs. McNaughton has informed me that you believe that Elveria, and possibly myself, had her own witcheries to add to the family. You are of course correct. Elveria has inherited from my line certain forms that you yourself share, and from her father's line a touch of healing gift for which his ancient ancestress was known. She looked over at her daughter, who only nodded. And like you, she and her lesser extent, I have been using those witcheries to help our family, friends and neighbours survive this infernal occupation. Do not sell yourself short, mother, Elveria interjected. There are far more than a few in Mobile area who own their lives to you using those witcheries. I smiled at the revelations. Which one of you ladies do I owe the thanks for the aid on the night of All Hallows' Eve? Ah, that will be Elveria, Mrs. Beaumere said. And for what happened down by the river? The woman just casually admitted that her daughter was a theory and thrope, and that she was responsible for the deaths of nearly a dozen men in all. Theodore chuckled and said, It would seem that your bride may be a better hunter than you, Dan. Well, now that things are out in the open, I asked, are there any objections to continuing as we have proposed? Of course not, Elviria said. We have done as is in our nature. We have protected our family and friends, and I would never object to that. I smiled and said, If I had not known it already, I do now know that I am to wed a woman with iron will, and that means to back it up. That is something for which I am thankful. The women folks smiled and Teddy and I exchanged nods. If I might be indelicate, I asked, does this other form demand an appearance with a full moon? Elveria and her mother exchanged looks. It's usually stronger then, and in my first year or two it did. Now I control when and where she makes her appearance, Elveria told us. This change being tied to the moon is not always the case, Sheridan, Grandmother said. And my mother's been really good at teaching me to control it, Elviria added. And for that, I am just as thankful. Theodore said, I know of more than one time when she used her witcheries for my benefit during the time that I was indisposed. Those words alone, if not for no other reason, sealed my conviction I had chosen well for my wife. Then, to my surprise, he raised his apparatif and said, To many strong and healthy nephews and nieces, we all answered in the affirmative. From there, we rolled out the plans for Bon Travail, and Elveria and her mother made several suggestions on how to improve the place. That night, after the Beaumares had left for their own home and I was settling into my own bed, I found myself most pleased with the events of the evening and thought that they were a good omen of things to come.
I know not how long I had been asleep, when Theodore screaming awoke me, immediately followed by the sound of glass breaking. Any thoughts of modesty were ignored as I raced to my brother's room, wearing nothing other than my nightshirt. Turning the handle, I burst through the door in time to see the form of the creature that I had driven off last night, leaving the room through the shattered window. Theodore kicking and screaming in its arms as it stood at the edge of the rooftop. It looked back at me and smiled evilly and said in my mind, Follow me if you can, father. Tonight I feast on the heart of your brother. It then leapt from the roof into the backyard and disappeared into the woods beyond that that led to the river. Pulling the nightshirt over my head, I dropped it to the floor and set loose the raging beast in my soul. Between one step and the next, I felt the change begin as it had three nights ago. Agony and ecstasy merged into one single release of the man who stepped off the roof only to land in a dead run as a cat. The colour washed away from the world and the night around me became a stark tableau of greys. The scent trowel was nearly visible to me as my olfactory sense became sharper and more acute. Of course, the stench of this creature nearly overwhelmed the fearful scent of Theodore. Screaming into the night, I challenged the creature to turn and face me, but on it ran. Our passage was a ground of our in pace that passed through Bayou Menu, up through the streets of Mobile, and both of us care not whom or what observed our chase. The creature tore through a picket line of soldiers at the end of Broad Street as we left the city proper, killing one of them. His comrade raised his rifle to fire at it, and from behind as I bowled over him, I could not allow a stray shot to hit Theodore. For what felt like hours, we chased each other through Pritchard and then Chickasaw. We crossed all three rivers south of Ground Bay and turned south through Spanish Fort. The creature had an immortal endurance and it taxed my force of will, limited constitution to continue to follow him as he turned south again, making a beeline for the ruins of Chateau de la Mer. Once we hit the property line and were on a straight course, I began to close on him as we approached what appeared to be the first of a berm of earth I did not remember. As it leaped high over the earthen embankment, a dozen Union soldiers popped up with rifles and began to fire. I felt three out of the twelve 58 caliber rounds slam into my shoulder as I cleared the berm following the beast. As we rounded the bend in a road that led to the ruins of the old plantation, I expected several more volleys, but they never came. Instead, the creature tore across the old front lawn of the main house towards the tree where I had seen Elviria and her mother gathering bark the other night. Under it was the rider who escaped me. He was on a new steed that was as black as the beast I was chasing. More frightening was that its eyes glowed a malevolent red to match the Westhalls. And every so often, it would prance nervously and fire would shoot from its nostrils. Even at a distance, I could smell the sulphur in that fire. The man sitting on him was grinning as some madness danced across his face. Halt, Captain McNaughton, he demanded as the creature came to a stop just behind him. Whatever else he had to say was lost as I launched myself over him and past the creature. This action caught him off guard and for a second both stared in disbelief as I soughed past the hell beast. In the last second, my clawed arm lashed out and yanked a terrified Theodore from the creature's grasp. I hit the ground on three limbs and twisted and tumbled, tucking Theodore under me as we rolled across the lawn in the direction of the bay. Recovering from their surprise, the beast as well as the West Hall began to give chase. We'll corner him at the river, Westall commanded as he spurred his hunter to follow me. I crashed through the woods and sprinted as fast as I could towards the river as the hell beast closed with me. I was not going to make it to the river before it caught me, and so I skidded to a stop at the clearing where we used the more boats. The river was still a good 30 yards beyond. My unexpected move caught the beast off guard, and in desperation I used that time to spin like an athlete throwing a hammer and hurled Teddy out over the clearing, past the docks and into the river, hoping that he understood what he needed to do. You think my guana cannot swim? Westall screamed as he charged from the thicket, his sabre raised high over his head. Sidestepping his charge, I chuckled as I saw my brother hit the water in near perfect dive. In a pick of irritation, I kicked the nightmare steed in its back haunch as it passed me. 
It kicked out in retaliation, and I felt the red-hot razor-sharp horseshoe impact my hip and knock me backwards several yards, my fur and skin sizzling under the blow. The horse stumbled from my kick and nearly threw Westhall, who found himself holding onto the creature's withers with everything he had. Wham! I was blindsided by the guiner hitting me while I was trying to regain my balance. It raked its claws up my back as it bit into my shoulder and tried to tear away the muscles and flesh found there. My arms were pinned to my side as I fell backwards, pain nearly blinding me. Drawing up my legs between us, I began flutter kicking the beast with as much strength and speed as I could muster. I felt my back claws begin to fly away, flesh and muscle, and the creature let go of its teeth and howled in pain. I took the opportunity to free one of my hands and grab it by the throat and then squeeze with everything I had. I felt the claws sink into the beast's flesh when they met in the middle. I pulled my legs up under the creature and kicked hard and pulled my claws back. With a gurgling sound, the guiner was hurled backwards into the tops of the thicket of trees we'd exited. Rolling over, I staggered to my feet and shook my head. The unmistakable sound of a horse charging came from my left. The beast inside of me suddenly wrestled control of our body from me and screamed into the night. I felt it call upon my own will and poured it into the scream. The nightmare steed suddenly locked its hooves in front of it and tried to skid to a stop as the wave of sound and will hit it like a battering ram. It turned its head to the side, trying to avoid contacting us, and with a single strike, I felt the cat lash out, catching a black steed behind the jaw. I, we, pivoted and slung the horse to the side, pulling the jawbone from its socket and tearing away the flesh of the side of its face. This time... Westhall was flung from the saddle to land in an inglorious heap on the other side of his steed, his sabre lost somewhere in the high grass of the clearing. As he struggled to regain his mount, the guiner came charging out of the trees. A gurgling whisper of cry came from its ruined throat. I was beginning to reach the limits of my endurance. Two foes at once was proving more than I could handle. I needed to finish this fight quickly or all might be lost. Again, the cat breathed deeply, locked its claws out and screamed at the guiner before taking off at a dead run to meet its charge. We crashed like two freight trains, claws and jaws darting in and out of the furry and flurry of blows and bites until the beast finally managed to throw me away from it. Something tasted foul and dead in my mouth and I realised that it was whatever infernal ichor that thing called blood. As we spun away from each other, I glanced at the side to see that Westhall had regained his mount and was drawing a second saber from its scabbard on the other side of his steed. His eyes glowed brighter red as he wheeled the mangled horse around to charge me. I fought the cat's desire to stand its ground and wrestled back control of our body, and instead I turned and ran straight for the guiner as the horse and the rider bore down on me from behind. Momentarily surprised by the tactic, the beast just stared at me as we closed. Then, I leapt at its feet, my back claws bit into its shoulder and chest as I propelled myself high into the air. As the black steed and rider collided with the guiner beneath, all three went down into a tangle of fur, fire and fang. As I landed at the edge of the river, I took a second to look out to where I'd thrown Theodore. For just an instant, I saw a flash of huge silvery tail in the moonlight. A low growl of approval from the cat. I turned to face where my foes were trying to extricate themselves. I darted in and slashed at Westhall and then danced out of reach. I had missed my target, but I came away with one of the steed's eyes and breathing heavily. Westhall pulled the steed and guiner away from each other and looked at me. He smiled evilly and noted, You are tiring, Captain McNaughton. Soon. You will have neither the energy nor the will to fight both my guiner and me. Climbing onto the back of his steed, he added, I killed first your grandfather, and now I will kill you. He spurred his mount and charged me again, this time with the guiner at his side. He was right about one thing. I was nearly exhausted. My might could take either one of them, but not both simultaneously. The cat and me wanted to accept the inevitable and roll. But I was not yet finished. The words of a great patriot echoed in the halls of my mind. I have not yet begun to fight. 
As the rider and Guina bore down on me, there was a flash of white from the tree line, and suddenly the Guina was swept aside by the other cat from the other night. I rolled to the side, putting a horse between me and Westall's sword arm, and lashed out at the steed's unprotected flank. I felt the girth of the saddle part under one of my claws as it tried to dance away from me. Momentum could be a dangerous thing as the nightmare changed direction and the girth was cut. Westhall went one way and his mount another. He landed directly into my arms, his feet still caught in the stirrups. As he struggled to free himself, I grabbed him by the shoulder in one clawed hand and the head with another, twisted and then pulled apart. I was rewarded with a loud and the two separated, and the horse disappeared in an unholy cloud of sulfurous stench. Tossing both parts of the body aside, I looked to where the guina and the other cat were battling each other. She was rather impressive, and I could not help noticing how lovely her lines flashed in the moonlight. Somewhere in my mind, I realised I had been a widower for far too long. With a scream, I charged into the fight. The guina was wounded, its master dead and it was now facing two of us. Having distracted the creature with my scream, the other cat took the opportunity to dash in the, and deliver a powerful rake to its torso. The claw had struck true, and her clawed hand pulled it from its body, its lower intestines. Without hesitation, I rounded on its flank and drove my claw into its side. I felt the bones of its ribs shatter as my claw drove true and closer around something wet and beaten. Grabbing a hold, I yanked back hard and watched the creature tumble aside from our dual assault. Twin screams of triumph split the night air and the forest around us became silent as it echoed through the swamp and off the water. I took a moment to study the other cat and I realised that she smelled of man blood and flesh. She nodded and then looked back up the road towards the berm where the soldiers had ambushed me. I understood. She stopped to deal with whatever Union troops Westerwood had brought with him. It was at this point that two women stepped from the tree line, each of them carrying a bundle. It was Mrs. Beaumare who spoke first. Your job is not yet finished, children. But for what must be done, you must be in your man form. Grandmother said, handing me a bundle. Looking down, I sniffed it and realised it was my own man scent, taking it in a hand like poor. I nodded and slipped into the bushes. Much to my surprise, the beast was willing to withdraw without complaint. It was well pleased with this night. I had several wounds that were still closing of their own volition, including two rifle balls in my shoulder. Those hurt nearly as much as the bite wound on my other shoulder and the burn on my hip. Wincing in pain, I managed to pull on the clothes and stagger from the bushes. As grandmother approached, I looked around. Teddy's in the river. She nodded. I know. He's waiting for us to do what is required. Then he will do what he must, and our family can live in peace. Uh, at least for a while. I must have looked confused when she looked back at Westhall's body. This will not be the last time we must deal with Westhall, but we can buy our family a decade or so of peace. We will not be able to end him permanently until we know where he has hidden his soul and destroy the item in which he has stored it. Wearily, I nodded. What would you have us do? You have killed Westall, but even now his body attempts to repair itself, just as much as yours are. We must make the process that much more difficult for him. How? Teddy said it. Grandmother Kate said it. We will do it to him, what he did to my father. His head is already separated from his body. We will remove his heart from that body and then burn all three separately. I nodded over to the Guiner and asked, And that thing? Leave it for Colonel Shepard. He will think he has gotten his swamp cat and leave us in peace. Mm, you think so? She gave me a cold smile and said, I can guarantee it, Sheridan. Taking the saber from Westall's hand, I did as Grandmother bade. It took all four of our witcheries to set the fire hot enough to completely devour the body, and in the end, I'm still not sure we did for the man's red eyes glowed even through the fire and never seemed to burn away. Instead, as the skull and brains burnt around them, they rose into the air with the embers and disappeared into the early morning light. When that was done, we returned to the berm where lay dead a dozen soldiers. More bodies to explain, I said. 
It was Mrs. Beaumare's turn to chuckle. <laughs> Not quite, Captain Sheridan. Drag them to the river. You will see. Shrugging, I grabbed two of the soldiers by their boots and dragged them behind me. Reaching the edge of the river, where I had first peered into the water to see myself as the cat, we found Theodore there, sitting on a log, his good leg dangling in the water. Out in the black water of the Peridido, I saw several large fins cruising back and forth. Dropping the soldiers, I dashed forward and pulled him into an embrace. I cried, Tadpole! He seemed heavier than he should be, and I felt something wet against my trousers. Looking down, I realised that what had been in the water was not a leg, but part of a long, silvery, fish-like tail. Surprised? he asked. I nodded my head and said, I know I should be, but I'm not. The cat seemed to know far earlier than I did. It could sense your brother's gifts, even if you could not, grandmother said. What now? I asked. And with a cold mirth in his eyes, Teddy nodded his head towards the fins in the water. I, I promised them a hearty meal. Wow, wow. Absolutely excellent stuff there, Wayne. Um, truly exhausting. Thank God for editing, is all I can say. Um, thank God people don't speak like this anymore. It's so, so difficult, but um, I hope I pulled it off again. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as I. As ever, though, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. I hope you're all well and happy, and above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.